This is The Close-Up, conversations about creativity. From our studios in Los Angeles, here is Jim Chapin. Grant Anderson is here. He's head of studio for John, one of the hottest VR companies in the market right now. He served at Sony Pictures Entertainment and Visual Effects, where his work has been seen in Lord of the Rings, Aviator, Spider-Man, and Titanic. He also worked at Stan Lee Media and Apple. Welcome, Grant. How do you explain VR as being such a different experience? How do you explain it to someone who's trying to get their hands around what this is? Yeah, well, it's interesting because you can, you know, tell people, you can explain virtual reality for hours on end. You know, in the press, they try to explain it. They try to explain it on television, news broadcasts. We can try and explain it, explain it here. But really, until you experience it and get that aha moment, um, it's very difficult to describe. I mean, but it's really complete immersion. Um, it's transporting you to, to another world. I've never entered an industry, I have to say. I've, as you mentioned, I've worked in a lot of cool jobs. But I've never been more excited than when I started John um, because of the promise that this industry and this, um, this new creative medium, and it really is a new medium, allows. It's going to be amazing. John has the John One camera, mm -hmm. and you're building a studio in Los Angeles yep. in order to create content. Why both? Um, well, John started a couple years ago um, as a tech company, creating cameras. Um, you know, a, one of the very first purpose-built VR cameras uh, in the industry, as well as a set of what we call computational photography algorithms to take all of those cameras and stitch them together into this full 360 degrees 3D sphere that you can look around. Um, and of course, then the industry really started taking off. You know, um, Facebook invested two billion dollars in Oculus, so. There's nothing like that amount of money changing hands to really ignite an industry. Um, and we started creating content. And, you know, they were working with production companies and, you know, various other uh, entities in Hollywood. Um, and very quickly realized, of course, that content is king and that that's where, um, you know, the, um, the money is, quite frankly, and also where, um, you know, all the excitement and the value is in the end of the consumer. So they knew that they needed a studio, and that's where, where we started the Los Angeles studio. You worked at one point at Apple, a company that took the music industry and the video industry and changed it by getting all of us, myself included, comfortable with spending 99 cents to download a right. piece of music or uh, get Casablanca and download it. Right. So the idea of a Paul McCartney uh, concert in VR, which has been done, doesn't seem that out of the realm of reasonable saying, okay, I'm used to buying Paul McCartney's music. If for $9.99 I can download yeah. a VR version of a concert performance. Well, right. I mean, we're already doing that, right? You pay 99 cents for the song, but you can pay $1.99 or $2.99 for the music video. So you might want to pay $3.99, $4.99, $5.99, $10.99, we don't know yet, for the VR version, right? A VR immersive experience. And of course, we also want to see, you know, not just that, but, you know, going behind stage, right? Backstage, in the green room, after the show, with the performers and with their, you know, um, celebrity friends and the places that you would never get to see even if you paid for that VIP ticket. When you think of VR, is it wisest to say you don't use your uh, traditional media benchmarks as a starting point? Yeah, I mean, especially in terms of the way you make films or movies, TV, you know, there's, there's when we talk about the language of VR, there's you know been a cinematic language that's developed over the past hundred years. Um, you know when cinema first came out, they took a camera and they plopped it down in front of the stage and you know turned it on. So they're basically recording the performance. And over the decades, um, they developed this language of cuts and over the shoulders and you know clean shots and all of these different um, devices that you know in the beginning they never would have conceived of. And now in virtual reality, we're kind of starting all over. Um, you know, 3D in a way has its own language and we do things a little bit differently when we're making a 3D film, but virtual reality is completely different. Um, so it really is relearning how to tell a story without those devices. And I see people trying to cram their 2D sensibilities, uh, filmmaking skills into virtual reality and it just doesn't work. You have to totally conceive of it in a different way. This seems to be a global phenomenon. It seems to be every bit as hot in Shanghai as it is in Los Angeles. How fast does this scale up? Is this going to scale up faster, or is this something that we say, look, it's going to take 20 years before enough people see this to, 
to be worthwhile. Yeah, I mean, uh, the you know the numbers are all over the map. Every every marketing research report that you read is vastly different numbers in terms of finance finances and scale of deployment of head mounted displays and all of that. Um, but I think it's going to be pretty quick because it is, and the reason why it's it's universal. It's they're compelling experiences. It's literally being transported outside of yourself, outside of the world that you've been dealt, outside of the world that you're living in. You know, you can go to places that you've always wanted to go to. Um, you know, ultimately Facebook bought Oculus, I think, because they're about connecting people. And imagine when you, you and I can be sitting here having this interview, but you're in Tokyo and I'm in Los Angeles. Um, so it's incredibly compelling. So people are going to want it. Um, and it really all, I think, comes down to comfort, accessibility, price point, you know, the initial um, release of all the head-mounted displays are going to be fairly expensive, relatively, you know, three to five to six hundred dollars in addition to the PC to run them. Um, but we think of Jaunt, you know, we're supporting all those headsets, of course, but we think, and a lot of other people do as well, that the cell phone is going to be the delivery mechanism because, you know, it's like the camera, it's whatever one you have in the pocket, in your pocket is the one you're right, going to use. Right. And it's the same thing with VR. So, you know, imagine, and they're already coming out with these, a case that's attached to your iPhone with the lenses on it that you just flip around put in your earphones and now there you go. It's VR. Yeah. The level of quality you're going to get on a cell phone and a, and, a, and a cardboard is a level of magnitude of a dozen by the quality you're going to get by one of these headsets. Now. Now. I mean that's obviously going to change. All these things will merge. Um, the cell phone, I mean ironically the cell phone tech is what enabled this whole revolution, right? All the sensors, the gyroscopes, accelerometers enabled virtual reality. And so, you know, now we're going to see the, the components in the cell phone um, increase t with a bent towards VR, right? Already, you know, there's rumors that perhaps Samsung is, you know, putting in um, a, a stereoscopic camera in their new phones in order to do head tracking. I mean, you can obviously see that's a path that a lot of people are going to take. So the cell phone will, you know, inevitably march towards VR, and the high end um, head mounted displays will also come down both in size and scale and price, and you'll see them starting to meet in the middle, I think. And a big part of, you talk about being comfortable, is that the headsets are going to get to a point where they're less cumbersome to put on? Yeah, I think they're, you know, okay, so there's, they're going to come down in weight and size and price, and then they're going to become, you know, glasses, and then they're going to become little, almost like Google Glass was, where it's literally beaming light onto your retina directly, so there's no more screen, and then eventually there'll be contact lenses, you know. And then eventually will be the matrix where they just plug it into the back of your head. But is this will be the evolution. Is this a 10-year revolution? Is it a 20-year timeline? Well, is it? I think it's going to be pretty quick. I mean, obviously, the, the last few I mentioned are sci-fi for now. But um, the, you know, I think in the next five years, you're going to see a vast reduction um, in size and price of all the HMDs as well as the cell phones coming up in capabilities with more VR capabilities built in. When you talk to someone and before you hire them, what kind of people, what are you looking for? What takes, what does it take to succeed in doing the work in the field that you're working in right now in VR? Right. Um, well, obviously it's filmmaking skills, right? And also what makes a good narrative? What makes a good story? Those are universal. Those are always going to be important. Um, uh, Obviously, you know, if you're going to be shooting virtual reality, a good sense of how, you know, a camera operator or something like that can fairly easily learn um, virtual reality cameras. In fact, in some ways it's a lot easier because there's not a lot to touch um, because there are so many cameras and a lot of it's done in post-processing. Um, visual effects industry, uh, all of those, you know, lighters, compositors, and uh, rotomation and all of that stuff, animation, and all the same techniques that we've used on all those movies that you mentioned that I worked on, um, are the same techniques um, for virtual reality. It's just learning to work in a spherical 360 3D environment. We as an entertainment uh, industry worldwide have a tendency to think in terms of what we do is tell stories. And our directors frame the story and point you to what they want you to see. Uh, yeah. Can you imagine, because you're a filmmaker, you've come from this background, can you walk us through what a movie or a, a, a virtual reality experience might be that has as its course something that traditionally might have done, uh, been done as a movie or a television show? You know, w there's two camps of virtual reality. Right now there's um, the interactive camp, which is in real-time graphics engine, computer gaming engines, right? Which is interesting because 
early, you know, in cinema was computer graphics was very hard and very expensive, and it was like just go shoot it a lot easier. And now it's almost opposite the case, where CG is easy in VR and cinematic VR is difficult because the tool sets um, really aren't there. Um, but you know, you can easily see, you know, living in a haunted house, like, you know, a horror piece where you can even add overlays, whether it's cinematic or, or interactive um, in a gaming engine, where you get to pick the direction you go and where the horrors and the haunts are different. And yet there's still a, a through narrative, right, that um, when you come through, it's very much like interactive theater. Sleep No More in New York is a prime example. And I saw this a couple of years ago, and it was, you know, it's amazing as it is. You're basically, uh, you start out in this room, and you know the performance, it's Macbeth's um, Sleep No More, and it's in this building that they've taken over New York, and you know the performers start out, it's, very, it's all kind of done in slow motion to a really haunting sound effect, and then they all take off in different directions. And you know, you're, as an audience member, if you've never been there, you're all wearing masks kind of as you're you know, part of the performance, and you have to decide who you want to follow. And so the story, you know, you branch off with somebody else and you see a different performance on the third floor. And then they take off in different directions and come back and they meld back together with the original crew and tell a slightly different version of what you saw before or different aspects. You're, you're piecing together the bits of the story as you go through this whole evening. So, so it's amazing. So, so Im imagine a production that is, it is a story told, but you can, you can experience different aspects of the same story and then walk out of that building and say, I did this, I did this, where right. were you? Exactly, and that's exactly what you do in Sleep No More. When I saw with my friend and I came out, you know, we had the same sense of narrative overall, but we had completely different viewpoints on it, and we saw different things. Um, and you can even go off into the rooms and pull books out of uh, drawers and look through and have see a backstory on one of the characters. So it's this incredibly rich environment to explore, and that's really what virtual reality is great at. Um, and so, you know, and that goes to the replayability and repeatability. Um, you know, from a media perspective, we always want people to see our movies more than one time, right? Well, in VR, you really have a great shot at that because, you know, if we add interactive layers to it, you may not have seen the same thing. You may not have seen it all. Or even if we don't add interactive layers, you know, you may be looking over here when the action happened over here if you're directing, you know, multiple points of action in the same scene. So uh, uh, you're associated with the term language of cinema, cinematic VR. What, what is that? Well, we don't know. That's the <laughs> we are evolving that as we speak, right? There's the cinematic language, which is what I was, you know, referring to earlier in terms of, um, you know, over-the-shoulder shots, close-ups, coverage, clean shots, all of these things, this terminology, you know, that we could talk to any of the film crew here and they would know immediately what I'm talking about. Cinematic VR, because everything is so different and you don't know how to, you know, necessarily block a scene or how do you get the viewer's attention. You know, you can use motion, light, and sound to direct the viewer where you want them to look. Um, but all of this is just coming into our lexicon, right? We're, we're, just, we're figuring out what is the best way. Okay, you want to do a close-up. Well, you can actually have the actor walk close to the camera, and that's your close-up. Do you cut? Do you not cut? How much do you cut? How long are the cuts? We're trying to figure all this out both for what works cinematically and for the storytelling narrative, um, and also what's comfortable for the viewer, um, and also what's the most interesting. So it's an evolving language that we're adapting from 2D, of course, starting there, but it's gonna be totally different. We talked about your, your movies. Here are the directors that you have worked around. Martin Scorsese for The Aviator, Lord of the Rings, Peter Jackson, Titanic, James Cameron, Men in Black, Barry Sonnenfeld. What do all these guys have in common when you're around great directors that you stand back and say, let me tell you something about a great director. They are what? Um, they make clear choices. It's just like a great actor. They make very clear choices, um, and they know what they want. The best directors I've ever worked with know exactly what they're going to get when they go in and shoot on stage um, that day. And whether they have the shot list in their head or they have it written down, it's all boarded out. They know exactly what they're going to, or at least what they're going for. So you don't spend a lot of time going, well, I don't know, and you, you know, all this money and all this time spent on not knowing what you want on the day you show up. The best ones have a clear vision, um, and they know exactly what they want when they step onto that. So. Uh, name two movies you're looking forward to seeing this fall in 3D. Um, the Martian and The Walk. Great. And uh, name, recommend for someone watching who wants to see some VR that's easy accessible. What's out there that someone could look at that you'd say, this is pretty cool? Um, well, actually, speaking of The Walk, that um, was an amazing piece that I just saw. It's a tie-in to the film. And um, <laughs> I saw it at SIGGRAPH, 
and they actually put a rope on the ground, and it's about it's tied into the film with uh, the Joseph Gordon Levitt, exactly, who is walking across the twin towers based on the documentary Man on Wire, um, and it, you l it literally puts you up on the corner of the twin towers, um, and they put a rope under your feet, so you feel a rope under your feet. You put the VR goggles on, and you have to s take a step out onto that wire in virtual reality, and it is terrifying. It is the most terrifying thing, one of the most terrifying things I've ever seen, much less in VR. Um, well but it's amazing. And the concept of being with Matt Damon on the surface of Mars yeah. in VR sounds pretty cool. Yeah, it's amazingly yeah. cool. Yeah. Um, and of course, we have a bunch of cool content in our app. Um, you mentioned Paul McCartney. We have that. Um, we have experience uh, called The Hobbit that takes you to the Shire. Um, so there's all kinds of you know really cool and, content. And right. how do people access that? Um, it's the Jaunt app. It's on iOS and Android and also on Oculus Share. Great. Um, as you get along, please come back and tell us how it's going. This is incredible. Thanks a million for joining us. Thank you. The Close-Up is produced by the Advanced Imaging Society in Hollywood and powered by Barco.